Hello, my name is Jason Reichel, and you're listening to Risk Management Brick by Brick. I'm fascinated with people who are helping build and maintain the physical world around us. On each episode of this podcast, we'll dive in with a risk manager, speak to them about how technology plays a role in this process. Welcome back to another episode of Brick by Brick. We're here at Risk World. We're going to be talking to James Alexander. Thank you for joining me, James. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, why don't we start with a little bit about yourself? Why don't you give us a over 30,000 foot overview of your career and what are you here at Risk World trying to accomplish? Well, let's start with Risk World. I was here speaking yesterday on climate change resilience and uh, reporting using applied earth observation, but that's the end of my career this year. Started underwriting in 96, environmental impairment liability with Allianz, and then progressed on to broking and advisory through Willis Towers, Watson and Lockton, and started Meliora ESG Limited two years ago. Okay. Well, there's a lot to unpack in that, in, in that story. So let's, let's start. One of the things that I was interested in is with satellite-based structural auditing, like changing the way we understand how climate-related risk happens to infrastructure, like what types of risks is that exposing that we didn't know previously? I think the key thing to remember is when I started in my career in the 1990s, earth observation and satellite technology was really reserved for the defense sector and for government level activity. What's happened in the last 10 years is that access to open source data has become free to use yeah. and the analytic tools and the uh, applied uh, engineering tools to decipher that what's within the data has become accepted by the insurance industry and the regulatory industry alike. So it's been a progression of technology and a reduction in costs and acceptance is really, really strong. Yeah. So infrastructure wise, we believe in climate change. We believe the earth is changing, right? Not to get political. People are making decisions on this. How are assets owners and governments using that data to take action or are they just trying to make sense of it still at this point? Like, where are we in that journey to actually utilization? Well, it's a really good point. Yesterday, we were talking about extreme weather events and frequency and severity. But the multiplier for us at Meliora and, and with, with Ocean Ledger and Value Space and the other firms that I work with is many of the infrastructure assets are either overaged. Yes. They're older than 50 years. So we've got a reducing resilience within the asset itself, whether it's a railroad or a road carriageway, an airport. The extreme weather events and the change in macro changes in environment mean that the original resilience and the original design criteria are now under more stress and more pressure. Right. So applied earth observation and GIS, we're able to model retrospective data and create more meaningful contextual baselines as various climate change scenarios or weather event scenarios unfold. And for insurers, that's looking at aggregation and concentration. But I think the, the main thing to consider is if you're designing a new infrastructure asset in 2025, you're designing to today's standards with today's materials. But so many insured assets are 25 to 35 to 55 years old. Yes. They weren't designed to similar tolerances as, as modern features. Yeah, I'm from, I live in San Francisco now in, the, uh, in Silicon Valley. But I'm from Seattle, Washington, and I just was reading that the bridge are closing down half of uh, Mount Rainier because the bridge structurally can't handle it and it's not safe anymore. And there's no way to really rebuild that with today's, like making it future-proof in a way. Uh, yeah, future-proof is a really a, a massive concept. But what we do and, and what our clients are doing is we're using structural audit to detect anomalies. Because let's say you've got a hundred data points. If 90 of those data points are showing no exceptional movements or except, exceptional damage or exceptional potential for damage, we want to focus on the 10 data points that are outside of tolerance. So the application of satellite technology really focuses remedial works, early intervention, and allows us to see almost in real time when movement is showing an underlying causality that you might not notice. So short of rebuilding, repairs and maintenance and active intervention, active closure to protect risk and protect society 
can be really, really uh, powerful in the risk management framework, even if it's uninsured, if it's a municipal asset, if it's state or government managed asset. You can be planning better. Y yeah, you can be r planning rather than being reactive. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, bridge decks, supporting structures, but the change often isn't in the bridge deck. The change is in the supporting geology, yeah. which is getting wetter and is getting less strong because of continual and rapid change in big weather and extreme weather events. Do you consider what you're doing to just be part of modern infrastructure, things that modern builders need to take into account? Because, you know, there's an argument that, oh, you're making builds more expensive when you use, like, when you do this data. I mean, I'm all for it, you know, but like when we talk about this, what are the real world impacts to getting projects built if you're looking through all this? Or do you think, no, this makes projects sustainable and actually tolerable? That's a really good question. So as a former underwriter and as a risk professional, infrastructure projects initiated, funded, designed and constructed, and insurance is just an enabler to smooth the risk profile in that process. So the, the asset and the infrastructure is the starting point and the insurance and risk management community support the delivery of that asset. Even 15 years ago, a pre-construction survey, a planning process for a mine or for a large infrastructure program could be 10 years in design. Yes, right. So for 10 years, you've got surveyors and boots on the ground. And during construction, you've got multiple individuals on the ground, ground truthing the progress. We can do a 15 million hectare analysis on a waterfront or port development in under four hours. And we can do that. We can do that in at a six day frequency pre, during and post build. So if you've got dynamic compaction over surcharging and settlement subsidence management, when if you're working in a coastal zone where you've got sensitive, uh, uh, potential inundation or surge risk or sea level rise exposure, you still need boots on the ground to comply with your construction permit and your planning permit or your federal or, or in the UK in your town and country planning act laws. But everything within applied earth observation is augmenting. It's not replacing. Right. So you might be able to detect an anomaly earlier. So it doesn't become a increased cost of working or a delayed startup claim. It just becomes a, an issue to deal with during that construction phase. But my focus and my experience is on 10 to 25 year long insurance programs yeah. where you, you've got a three to five year lead in a three year construction period and then a 10 year operational phase. So, um, it, it's, a it's a shifting of the paradigm in a way. It is. And, and I mean, I'm not an, but Gartner, Gartner predict that 80% of insured assets will be surveilled by applied earth observation within the next six years. And that's going from 20% this year to 80% in, in six years time. So. If Gartner are looking at it, it, it's... And the insurance companies need it too, because it's the only way they're going to be able to go into markets, build a risk profile that makes sense yeah. and allows them to stay competitive in, in the space as well. Yeah. And, and insurers are looking at a different metric. Uh, they're looking at claim velocity, concentration and aggregation and portfolio performance. So if we're working with insurers comparing a 10 year loss run retrospectively, when we start using applied earth observation, we can now live track propagation of claim, notification of claim, settlement velocity and time and give insurance metrics rather than physical movement metrics. Yeah. yeah? Right. And that, that's the important thing for, for the carrier right. community. Yeah. yeah. That's their, that's their difference between a great year and big dividend or, uh, an itchy squeaky time of, uh, oh, this is close. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you've worked across, you know, ESG strategy, structural risk, innovation, all that. What connects to this work for you personally? Like why this field for you? Okay. So the last decade of my career, I was international environmental lead at two global brokers, but I could see that insure tech development and applications of generative AI and large language modeling and simply the number crunching potential of tech could unlock new product designs, new wording designs, particularly within first party supply chain and first party business interruption. But I'm quite an old, old guy. 
what have excited me was the young professionals coming out of risk management degrees, risk management masters, people like Remel Khatib at Lockton, people like Hannah Smith in London, who are setting out on a career in risk management. Yeah. And applications of big data, use of satellite technology, when you put Paige Ropers, Rayo Pold, other Lloyd's Lab cohort companies, and then there's 20 companies going through innovation hubs every year. These young professionals are showing established insurance providers a new way of managing and delivering technologically driven underwriting methods. And that's what excited me. Coming in with this in their kit to begin with. It's part of their basic risk management framework. Whereas like, you know, I'm talking to a risk manager at a large construction company and they're acting like this is a drag to be adding to that. Not to say that it's a young versus old kind of thing, but it's nice to see some of this stuff becoming the baseline versus an additive part of the risk profile. It's very much an additional part of the process, but I think for somebody at my stage in my career in my 50s, I've got underpinning insurance knowledge of how the insurance market works. Yeah. So for me to be able to learn from a younger professional who comes in and says, we can do this with this applied technology. Yeah. I'm then looking at the outcomes of that technology and the relevance to insurance. And with a global insurance provider writing a conventional line of business, if you're writing a three-year, five-year claims made wording, you're on risk for five years. Yeah. You're not turning the ship around for at least three and a half years. Yeah, right, right. So that elasticity of uh, reaction being really, really uh, long, over a long time frame, the pace of development in underwriting, especially around ILS, uh, insurance link securities, and parametric and alternative risk transfer structures, that's what excites me and, and, and has got me into working with both the funds and the operating companies in this sector. Here's a question from the audience. How can risk managers start incorporating satellite intelligence into their current risk frameworks without needing a PhD in geospatial data? I would say engage with a company that is taking complicated data streams and simplifying it to user experience. There's a number out there. Um, you don't need a PhD in, uh, in, in data science to understand the outputs delivered by these companies. But, Are there any names that you would shout out? Um, I would give a huge shout out to value.space, uh, Rayo and Agu Linfield, Rayo Bold. He's coming on the podcast later today. Yeah, Rayo, Rayo is a, a bright spark. Um, and then Paige Ropers and her team at uh, Ocean Ledger focusing on coastal risk. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, and the coastal zone, the concentration of, of exposure for both property and for, for logistics and marine you know, they're, they're two companies that I'm really proud to work for because their user experience, if I can understand it, then anyone can. This is a, another question from the audience. What's a common myth or misconception about climate risk that you run into often, especially from executives or boards? Because I think this is coming from someone in a construction company trying to get their boards and teams to be pay more attention to this and have it be part of the factor. Okay, it's, uh, I'd say that there's been a lot of negative opinion around ESG as a principle. Um, but as an environmental underwriter, I don't see, I don't really see that ESG is anything novel. It's just a new name for being a good corporate citizen, res respecting your environment and, and using good governance to deliver good outcomes. But, and you would eventually see these effects on the ground at some you, point. You'd see them but, on the but ground. Not, yeah. Yeah. But way, way too late. late. But I, I spoke yesterday about the materiality thresholds for security and exchange commission reporting and talking to the audience. You know, one of the takeaways that we discussed was the only party that determines the materiality threshold of your actions and, and material risks within your portfolio is you as the operator. Right. You can't rely on anybody else. You've got to form an opinion as a board and report with transparency, integrity, and honesty. Yeah. And, and I, I think every board should be doing that. And, and when, to answer the question posed, um, it's on your desk, you know, you've got to Maybe do don't work at a company where your executives are bored. So don't care about this. Yeah, but I'm the ones that do. Yeah, use, use your advisory channel. So your broker, your counsel, your lawyer, your technical and both in-house and out-house advisors should be giving you a clear and transparent footprint of what you're doing. Um, and it's up to you to, to communicate that to your, to your stakeholders. Um, 
So yeah, it's uh, it's an internalized risk and it's every on everybody's balance sheet. But if you do it properly, it gives a, a commercial and competitive advantage. Yeah. The data supports that. You know, companies with better ESG scores have better yields and better returns and better exits. Right. So it's a good thing to I do. think it can be a competitive advantage, especially if you have it as one of your values and you're going into as this is a value we have. And it's, um, there's a, you know, working in environmental liability, you're often working with people with big permits, with big environmental footprints who are having environmental impact, but it's regulated and it's permitted. So I think for many industries, take a look at what good firms are doing. Look at the top of the, the CDP listings or the Moody's listings. Look at those firms who've got great ESG scores and, and, and see what they're doing and how they're doing it. Uh, let's play a game of risky or too risky, okay? Yeah, cool. Okay, cool. So uh, first one here that I wanted to ask you, ignoring minor safety violations to meet project deadlines, risky or too risky? Too risky. Too risky. How, from your experience, how do you create a culture of where even the most minor things are important to this? You know, I often tell my, my girlfriend when you drive past a construction site, there's probably some kind of insurance claim happening. That's why no one's working here, right? So like, you know, so what, what's, what's your take on that? My take on it, having been on site and having been a contractor is small bending the rules adds up to big risk. When things tend to go wrong, they start small and they rapidly get bigger. And I, I had 11 years as an arborist working in the woods with chainsaws and climbing trees. So we would work to the book and yeah. when bad stuff happens, it happens quite quickly. Continuous business relations with a supplier known for ethical violations, risky or too risky? Too risky for me personally. I like to work with like-minded folks and people. I'm a former underwriter, yeah. so I'm, I'm a. Too, I, I too, imagine all these are going to be too risky. To, to the book guy, yeah, um, yeah. I'm risk averse. I don't know why I race cars and play books. How do you change the book then? If sometimes the book is wrong, what is it? Data is it a database approach for you, bringing data to it to show that the data has changed. Like, how how do you change the book? I think the thing. If we're talking about uh, bending the rules in practice or bending the rules on a work site, the key thing to me is having an empty accident book, but a really full near miss book. Uh, hey, yeah. So if you can get your staff to confidently report, if something feels bad, if something feels wrong, it probably is. And they should be able to report that in a way without blame or without repercussions. Being protected. And that makes the site safer, yeah. Yeah. Volunteering in an area known for infectious disease without vaccination, risky or too risky? It's risky, but I would do it if the volunteering outcomes are right. Yeah. Um, I've traveled the world. I think I'm vaccinated, but if, if there's a demand and a need there to, to help folks or to help a client, then I would go. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. That's all right. It's a pleasure. Thank you, man. Thank you. Risk Management Brick by Brick is brought to you by TrustLayer. Find out how TrustLayer manages risk so that the people can build the physical world around us. Head over to TrustLayer.io. And then make sure to subscribe to Risk Management Brick by Brick on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. On behalf of the TrustLayer team, thank you for listening. <laughs>